Savior and my friend, by your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. Let your power overflow, by your grace I live and breathe to worship you. The grave could not contain you, cause you wear the victor's Lord Jesus, and you have overcome the world, Lord Jesus, and we praise your name, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the victory, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for overcoming all of our insecurities, our fears, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord, for giving us the victory, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. All I once held dear, built my life upon all this world reveals and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I had counted loss, spent in worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. is to know you more, to be found in you, and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness. Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise your holy name, Lord Jesus. You're everything, Lord. You're the all, Lord Jesus, of everything that we need, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Every new day, your glory unfolds. Filling my eyes with your treasures untold. The beauty of holiness brings worship anew. My greatest love every new day. Every new day, your glory unfolds. treasures untold. The beauty of holiness brings worship anew. My greatest love is you. Call me deeper into your grace. The 
dancing me through my greatest love is you we praise you Jesus Lord we praise you we praise your holy name Lord Jesus hallelujah 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 I don't think there's anyone in this sanctuary that would disagree that we live in some very, very evil times, don't we? We just saw uh, the bombing in Turkey at the airport, and we live in a lot of dangerous times. Uh, we've had two or three incidences in our own country. And I've watched people, and I've seen a lot of different reactions uh, to these circumstances not counting all the political grandstanding that we see. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about people. And some people just, they don't want their life to change. They want their life to go on as they planned it, and they just kind of ignore the situation. It doesn't affect me, so it's not something that I need to worry about. And there are other people that are kind of like Chicken Little, the sky is falling, and we have to do something, and we have to and they are almost border on paranoia. Like I said, we live in dangerous times. And Jesus told the disciples, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen? And Colossians 3.15 tells us this. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts and lives. And as Christians, our response should be measured. We should respond the way God would have us to respond. Our hope and our trust and our faith is in God. And we need to let his peace rule and reign in our lives. Amen. Let's sing this song. Father of God, draw me closer. Lord, my heart is set on you. Let me run the race of time with your life enfolding mine and let the peace of God let it reign. Oh, Holy Spirit, you're my comfort. Strengthen me for my head. And I'll stand upon your truth, bringing glory unto you, and let the peace of God, let it reign. No, oh Lord, I hunger for more of you. Rise up within me, let me know. Saturate my soul and let the life of God fill me now. Let your healing power breathe life and make me whole. And let the peace of God let it rain. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit.
said a moment ago, we live in perilous days. We live without any question in the last days. Days, Lord, that you foretold in your word long before they began to happen, that they would take place. And you told the disciples, I've told you these things so that when they do, take place. My peace will reign in your hearts. And Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, for this world. I pray, Father God, for those victims, families that are still hurting in Turkey. That explosion and the violence that filled that airport. I pray, Lord, this past week for the families that were lost in Bangladesh, some of them, Lord, U.S. citizens. I pray, Lord, for the 91 that were killed by explosion in Iraq this morning. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, we have never needed your peace like we need your peace today. Our world has never been as traumatic and filled with turmoil as it is today. But Father God, you have your church here in days and times just like these for a reason. And I pray, Father God, that the peace of God will shine brightly in the Christian community, Lord, that this world will see that there's only one sure, safe place to place our hope, and that is in the unchanging hands of our almighty God. Father, Lord, we pray for all of those that are on our prayer list. I pray, Lord, this morning for Susan, who's in this service, but she needs a touch from the Lord. And for two friends of hers and Mary's, Lord, that lost loved ones this past week, Father, will you comfort, will you minister by your power, will you minister by your presence, Lord, to all of those this morning that might have need of comfort and strength, Lord, that only you can give. Father, we pray, God, for young person by the name of Holly, I don't know her, but you do, that has been diagnosed with cancer. Father, I pray, Lord, for Brenda Weber this morning that they found that new spot on her lung. I just ask that you will touch Brenda right now. Let your healing power, let your healing presence flow through her body, Lord. Uh, God, minister a miracle to her, Lord. Uh, Father God, I pray, Lord, for Brother Buffington in this service that you will continue the healing process, Lord, within his body following surgery. Uh, I pray, Lord, for Brother Andy and Mary Jones, both of them, Lord, that need a touch from you. Uh, and just ask, Lord, that you will let your healing power and prayer presence flow, Lord, for those that may be in this service that, God, I'm not aware of, but you are. I just pray, Lord, that you would minister your power and your presence right now to them because, Lord, you are Jehovah, the Lord God that healeth of all our infirmities, O oh Lord. Father God, I thank you for this wonderful holiday weekend that we have to celebrate as a nation, and we're grateful for this nation. America has 
many sins that grieve the heart of God. America has many shortcomings, Lord, but we are grateful for this nation. We're grateful this morning to be called Americans. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, for those who fought for the freedom that we enjoy this morning, God, that we can come to this house of worship without fear or worry, God, and worship you from the dictates of our heart. We're grateful for the liberty, Lord, that we have as Americans. But most of all, Lord, we're grateful for the liberty that we have as individuals human beings that were fallen in sin and shaped in iniquity. But now we have life and we have freedom and we have liberty because he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Father, I thank you for this group of people gathered here on this holiday weekend. Thank you for John and the worship team who have led us in praise and worship God and opened our hearts to you and taken us into the very throne room of our God. And Lord, I just pray you'll continue to move and minister throughout the remainder of this service today. Let all things be done for your glory and for your honor and for the lifting of your kingdom, Lord, and we'll give you thanks and praise for we ask it in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Listen to me when I tell you, this is a passage of scripture we need to hear today. Just like Goliath stood on the battlefield and called out one of Israel to fight with him, I want you to understand the battle that you and I wage today, even though we are a corporate people, is fought one person at a time. The enemy has called you out. The enemy has called me out. And listen to me, the results of winning or losing this battle that you and I are in are the same as it was for David and Israel. If we lose this battle we're speaking of, we become the slaves to sin. We become in bondage to the flesh. If on the other hand we win, guess what? The flesh loses. Satan loses. And that is exactly what God desires for each and every single one of us this morning. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity, Lord, and the privilege that is ours to come to this house of worship on this July 4th weekend. We are grateful, Lord, for this body of people that are gathered here, each and every single one. Thank you for every family that is represented. Thank you, Lord, for this church as a corporate body and entity. But, Lord, help us to see and understand that the battle, winning the battle in the church is as simple as each one of us winning the battle in our own individual lives. Lord, Monday morning, it won't be the church fighting, it will be individuals fighting the enemy. Late on Friday night, it won't be the corporate church, it will be the individual needing victory over the enemy of our soul. 
And so, Lord, for the next few moments that we are privileged together, I pray that you will bless your word to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we will apply this word to our lives and we'll be careful to give you the praise and thanks and blessing for we ask it in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I'm sure that you have surmised by now that we are forsaking our parable series this morning. I love sharing parables, sharing series of messages like the parables. I love that because I believe that it helps us to appreciate and get a better understanding of the Word of God. And most of the Year long, on Sunday and on Wednesday, I do the vast majority series messages. But I always want to keep my heart open and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Aren't you grateful this morning for the leading of the Holy Spirit? I don't know what we would do without the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And listen to me when I tell you, I want more than anything to be led by the Spirit of God as the Son of God. But even before I sat down to prepare the message for this morning, I felt a stirring in my spirit, in my heart, that we should move away from the parable series this morning and that we should go to the passage of Scripture that I have just read to you. Through the years, I have learned that whenever the Holy Spirit changes a message, it's for a reason. And the reason is generally because he wants to do something new or he wants to do something special in our lives. The reason is is because there's someone or some ones there who need to hear not just any word from God. They need to hear a specific word from God on a specific need that they're faced with in their life at the moment. I'm glad that he's mindful of our situations and circumstances. And listen to me when I tell you, I want your heart to be encouraged this morning in the Lord. I want you to know and understand just how much God loves you. I don't care if you're man or woman, if you're young or old or in between. I want you to know God loves you with an undying love this morning. He loves you so much that he would change the order of this service uh, just so that he could speak a word to your heart, uh, just so that he could minister to a situation and a circumstance that you have within your life today. I want you to understand he loves you that much today the story that I've read to you or the story in part that I have read to you is one of the most well-known stories of all God's word it's one of the most favorite bedtime stories I suppose that at least little boys ask for our oldest grandson Jacob When he was little, this was absolutely his favorite bedtime story. And we didn't, I didn't read it to them. I just told them any story that I told them. I just told them I don't recall ever sitting down and reading a bedtime story to them. I would tell Jacob this story about David and Goliath. And being the preacher I am. I didn't just give him all, you know, the facts. And he would stop me sometimes because I realized that Chris's David and Goliath story was a little different than my David and Goliath story. But this David and Goliath story is not just a bedtime story for kids. It's a story for kids of all ages of all times in our lives because for one reason it reminds us that no matter what God is still God 
It reminds us that nothing is impossible with God. It reminds us that when we're up against a situation or a circumstance or a giant that we don't know what to do with and we feel outmatched by, we know that it's not too great for our God. I believe that's why the Word of God says unless you and I become as a little children, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God because, listen to me, kids can believe God for anything. I remember when I was just a young boy, I don't know how young, but I was very young. Our family fell on a bit of hard times if my memory serves me right, and Larry's a whole lot older than I am, so (laughs) he probably remembers that. (laughs) Happy birthday tomorrow. Doesn't seem like you ought to be 70 yet. Uh, But if my memory serves me right, Dad had gotten laid off, and our family was having a little bit of tough time, and we were living in a green trailer out behind Grandma and Grandpa Harmon's house. And some point during that, I don't know how long it lasted, a few months or however long it was, I'm not exactly sure, but at some point during that time, I asked my father for an airplane. I don't mean a play airplane. I mean a real airplane. I told you I've always had a wild imagination. And I asked him for an airplane, and he set me down, he tried to... to explain to me, son, they are very, very expensive, and not only are they expensive, but you're too young, and I want you to know sometimes, son, they fall out of the sky, and they can be dangerous, and, but none of that mattered to me. I wanted an airplane. That's all I could think of, and I could not understand why my father could not get that for me. Listen to me when I tell you our heavenly Father knows no such limitations. You hear me when I tell you there's not anything you can ask of him he can't do. There's not any situation or circumstance or need in our life that he cannot minister to and meet. So I want to say to you this morning, I don't care how big your giant is. I don't care this morning how impossible your situation is. I don't care how unmovable you think that mountain is. I want you to know that our God knows no limitations and there's not any mountain he can't move and there's not any giant he can't take out of your path if we will just believe him for it. With that thought in mind, Let's get into the message, lest I keep you here all this holiday weekend. Three things very quickly I want to share with you. And the first thing is the situation that David finds himself in. Now let me say to you that I don't care how old you are or young you are or how long you've served the Lord. I don't care if you're a charter member of this church. You're always going to have some giants in your life to have to deal with. And listen to me when I tell you that sometimes there is no question our giants are of our own making. Sometimes we create those giants. Sometimes we create those circumstances and situations by sometimes the dumb decisions that we make sometimes the life that we choose to live, sometimes the friends that we choose to hang out with, but, and I love those conjunctions, it doesn't make any difference why you're facing that giant. God still wants you to hear that the battle belongs to him. It may be a battle of your own making. It may be a giant produced by your own shortcomings. But I want you to know he still wants to fight the battle for you this morning. Reminds me of a story I heard of a boxer who was in the ring and getting beat to a pulp. Finally, the bell rung and he went over to the corner and his trainer 
was trying to encourage him. He said, man, you're doing great. That bum is hardly touching you. To which he responded, then you better keep your eyes on the referee because somebody's killing me. <laughs> you can deny the giant if you want to. You can try to smooth it over. You can try to act like it's not there. Listen to me, I don't know about you, but I've always been a kind of person I wanted people to think I had things under control. And you may be the same way. But I want you to hear me this morning when I tell you I don't care who you are, we got giants to fight and we don't need to be denying that their existence. We don't need to be trying to downplay who they are. Look at verse 23 with me if you will. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Now, I just want to draw your attention back to one little phrase of that verse that I read to you, and that's this. Goliath, the Philistine, the champion from, from Gath. Listen to me this morning when I tell you, David did not go looking for this giant. David was not out there looking for a battle. Let me just refresh your memory about this story in case you've forgotten some of it. David wasn't the only son of Jesse. Jesse had three older sons than David, and they were off fighting with King Saul against the Philistine. Jesse, just like any good parent wanted to know that his three sons were okay. And so he sent the servant out to the sheepfold where freckle-faced David was keeping the sheep and told the servant to send David to home. When David comes in, his father Jesse gives him some supplies and some food and he says, I want you to go down and I want you to take these supplies and provisions to your brother in the battle. And I want you to see how they are faring. See that they're okay. When David gets there, this Philistine comes out on the battlefield and begins to defy the forces of Israel. You say, Pastor, what's the point? The point is this. David didn't go looking for a giant. The giant came looking for him. David wasn't there to fight. He wasn't a warrior. He was a shepherd boy, a, a ruddy-faced shepherd boy. And he was not there to fight he was there to check on the welfare of his brothers. You say, Pastor, what's the point? The point is this. God, I believe, expressly told me to tell some of you today that you are facing a giant that is not of your own making. You're facing and fighting a giant that you didn't ask to be fighting. You're dealing with a diagnosis of cancer that you didn't ask for. You're dealing with a pink slip from the job that you didn't want. You're trying to free a son or daughter who's bound by drugs, and that is not what your desire for them is. You didn't ask to lose your home, but you lost it. You didn't ask for your spouse to walk off and leave you, but they have. You didn't ask for your body to be racked with pain, but it is. Listen to me when I tell you God said to tell you today that he understands you are fighting against a giant that you didn't ask to be fighting against. It was not what you wanted. It was not in your making. But you're having to deal with it nonetheless. Look at verse 23 with me of our text. 
As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine, the champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, the Philistine, the giant, they all ran from him in great fear. When you read the story, you have to ask yourself, I think, what was it that David saw that all of Israel failed to see. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want you to understand, David was faced with a situation he did not ask to be faced with. He didn't like it. He didn't want it. He didn't ask for it. He didn't desire it. But he was thrust into it nonetheless. The second thing that I want you to see here from this passage of Scripture is not only the situation, but the scoffers or the slanders. Look at verse 26 of our text with me, if you will. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me tell you, that's some faith coming out of a ruddy-faced shepherd boy. He says, what shall be done for the man who kills this giant who has dared not just to defy the armies of Israel but to defy the God of Israel David's brother overhears him asking this question I just read to you verse 28 says when Eliab David's older brother uh, actually it says oldest brother like mine Sorry. <laughs> You're right. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come here? And with whom? Now listen to this. Talk about belittle. And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Listen to me when I tell you that sometimes when you decide to face the giant, some of your biggest critics will be those of your own household. They'll doubt your motives. They'll question your reason. They'll misjudge your intention. David says, what have I done? Can't I even speak? King James says, is there not a cause? But not only did David's brother slander him, Saul, whether he meant to or not, slandered him. Look at verse 31. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from is you. Listen to me when I tell you that there will be those who will not only question your motivation, but they will question your ability to fight this giant. I've heard them. I've had them say it to me. You can't do that. No one else has been able to do that. You'll never be able to make it. There's those who are stronger than you, and they couldn't do it. And listen to me, sometimes your own flesh will slander you. Sometimes it's not what you hear others saying to you, it's what you hear your own spirit saying to you. You're not up to the task. Why, who in the world do you think you are? 
Listen to me when I tell you when those who slander and even and especially when it comes to yourself and your own spirit and you doubt and you question what you can and what you can't do, I want you to say to yourself, I'm not just anybody. I am a child of the king. Royal blood flows through my veins. God's word says I am not just a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved me and no weapon formed against me can prosper and when the enemy does come in like a flood the spirit of God will lift up a standard and a hedge against him listen to me when I tell you don't listen to the slander even if it comes from your own spirit but look at verse 42 because this is important Goliath the enemy, the giant, slandered and scorned him. He looked at David, verse 42, he looked David over. You ever had somebody look you over? It's uncomfortable, isn't it? That's what Goliath was doing to David. He was trying to intimidate him. He looked him over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you came to me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Listen to me when I tell you without any question whatsoever, the enemy of your soul will do his best to scoff you and slander you every opportunity he gets. It's always been the enemy's way. You can go over to Nehemiah chapter 4 and see where the Jews in Nehemiah were getting ready to rebuild the wall. And Samballat says to them, who do these feeble Jews think they are? They will never get done what they're trying to do. You can go over to Daniel chapter 3. When the Hebrews were trying to stand for what's right. And they're standing before King Nebuchadnezzar. And he warns them a second time. That when the music plays. If they don't bow their knee. Before this image that he set up. He will have them thrown into the fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar adds to that. And who is the God. Who is able to deliver you out of my hand. Listen to me when I tell you. The word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 18 that you and I should be self-controlled and we should stay alert and we should stay on our guard because we have an enemy. We have an adversary like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may destroy. Listen to me when I tell you you can't afford to listen to the scorn of the enemy not even for a second. Not only do I want you to see the situation and the slander and scoffers, but the support that is given. You need to hear and understand this morning. When you decide to step out and face your giant, you're going to get some support. Look at verse 32. David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight for him. Listen to me when I tell you. I said a moment ago, I asked a question a moment ago. When you read this story, you have to ask yourself, what was it that David saw that all of Israel didn't see? Now, let me just remind you of something. He's speaking to King Saul. And if you can remember back when King Saul was put in as king, it expressly tells us that Saul stood head and shoulders over everybody else in Israel. He was a big man in stature. And when Goliath came out on the battlefield, he was running just like all the rest of Israel was running. What was it? 
caused David to see something that King Saul, who stood head and shoulders over everybody else, didn't see. Everybody else saw a giant. David saw God. I said everybody else saw the giant, but David saw God. Can I tell you where your gaze, where your focus is, is so vastly important and hinges, your victory hinges on where your gaze and your focus is. Peter did not begin to sink until he got eyes on the waves instead of the way maker. The disciples' eyes were on the loaves instead of the Lord. Elisha's eyes were on Jezebel instead of Jehovah. Gideon's eyes were on the odds instead of the omnipotent one. Let me tell you, if you want to defeat your enemy, rather than seeing the giant, you need to start seeing how great your God is. You need to see that he is the almighty. I don't care if the giant is 10 feet tall. Your God has no limit. He has no anything beyond his ability. You need to make Make sure that your focus is staying upon God, not the giant you're faced with. The situation, the slander, the support. Look at verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. This day, this day, the Lord will hand you over to me. Can you just hear that coming out of a ruddy-faced shepherd boy standing before this massive giant? This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcass of the Philistine, listen to me, not just the Philistine Goliath, I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Can I tell you thousands of years has transpired since that time and I'm up here in the pulpit this morning telling you once again there is a God in Israel who sees, who knows, who will always help us. So that all will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword It is not by spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Your giant does not stand a chance when you fight him in the name of the Lord. It's not about who you are. It's not about how great you are. It's not about how strong you are. It's not about what you can do. It's about what your God can do through you. I believe God changed the order of this service today because he wants you to know No weapon formed against you can prosper when you go in his name. No giant, I don't care how massive he looks, look beyond that giant, look beyond that circumstance, look beyond that situation and see, keep your eyes on the greatness of who God is in your life. The battle does not belong to you and I. It belongs to the Lord. Stand with me if you will. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, the awesome privilege of standing in this pulpit this morning, 
of speaking your word, not my word, your word to this people. I thank you, Lord, that you've called me this morning to remind this people that they're fighting against a giant, maybe of their own making, or it may be one like David that they didn't ask to be fighting, but they are. To remind us all that greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. To remind us this morning the issue is not how big the giant is, the issue is how great our God is. How mighty, how massive he is. And Father, I pray that you will speak your word to our hearts and let this people act upon the truth of your word and gain victory over whatever giant it is that they're faced with today. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a chorus together in just a moment. I know he rescued my soul. His blood has covered me. If you're here this morning and you've got a giant in your life, it makes no, listen to me. It, God was very express because I don't think God wants you to stand out there this morning and say, well, that giant's my own making. It's my own fault. I, I did it. I can't blame Satan. I can't blame. Listen to me. God wants you to know this morning that no matter whether you're facing a giant that is of your own making or you're facing a giant you didn't want to be faced, but you are, it makes absolutely no difference to him. He still wants the battle to belong to him. As we sing that chorus together, if you have a giant, you're faced with a financial giant, a physical giant, whatever it happens to be, I want you to come stand across this front this holiday weekend. We're going to sing it through, and then we're going to ask the brother of the board to come and begin to lay hands on you and begin to pray for you and begin to believe that God's going to give you victory over that giant in your life. You come and stand as we sing it together. I know. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I know. Rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. Yes, I do. I believe. Listen to this. My shame. My shame. He's taken away. My pain. He's healed in his name. I believe. Come on right now. I believe.
I believe they can carry it on without you, but I want us to join together this morning as we sing.